I will bring uh, the meeting to order. Um, my name is Robin Lunge. I am a board member here at the Green Mountain Care Board. Claudine, are you all set? Yes, ma'am. I'm ready with you. Okay. Um, I'm. I will be acting as chair today, um, as Chair Foster was unable to join us. Um, so I think what I'd like to do first is just welcome everyone, and then I. Uh, Bob, do you have your team with us? I do. Okay, great. So I'm going to turn it over to Russ McCracken to swear in the witnesses. I believe we've already sent Claudine um, a list of folks, so you don't need to spell your names, but it will be good for her to be able to identify who's speaking. So Russ, take it away. Uh, thank you, uh, board member Lunge. Um, Mr. Adcock and uh, Ms. Westcott, are you, uh, will you be the only two witnesses for Springfield today? Yes. That's correct. Uh, great. So I will swear you in if you would both raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Yes. Right. Thanks very much. Um, and I will turn it over uh, to you for opening remarks. All right. Thank you very much. Is um, is Sarah running the slides? I'm trying to present them. Can anyone else see them? Yes. I can I can see them perfectly. Thank you. I was just trying to determine who had the clicker. So um, we thought um, first off, uh, thank you for letting us present and talk about our hospital this morning. Um, you know, we have had what we believe is a unique history here at Springfield, particularly over the last five or six years. And that that unique history that we have continues to be something that we work on to address every day. And, and it's it's very central to all the things we do. So if we could, and so today it'll be Kata, our CFO and I presenting and uh, it's a picture of our um, gorgeous front lobby in the springtime. So it looks uh, looks good. Uh, no snow. So uh, if you can go to page two, Sarah, please. Again, I want to keep keep everyone in perspective about the last five or six years and the things that have happened to us here at Springfield. Um, you know, we are a 25 bed community centered critical access hospital. We also have a 10 bed distinct part psychiatric unit, which is located in Bellows Falls. So it's about 15 miles from the hospital, but it serves uh, a very important need for inpatient psychiatry in this portion of the state. Um, again, we, we have emerged from chapter 11, but the hospital continues, um, we continue to manage our situation as we try to move from being financially vulnerable to sustainable. And a good bit of what we'll talk about this morning are the things that we're doing this year to move us there. Um, you know, so our goal is to meet the healthcare needs of our local community. And we understand that, um, that you know, the social determinants of health in our community um, are challenging. And it's very important that we have access for this local population here. Um, we think that that is going to improve access um, make it easier for people to seek care that need it, and also um, less costly. And as we look at the cost slides, I think the um, I think that that um, we agree. You know that the cost slides validate some of the things we thought about our care versus other options that are available. Our primary second our primary service area has um, uh, a great deal of out migration, and the next statistic. Uh, 21,000 Springfield residents uh, spent $176 million outside of our service area. And those are those are statistics from the Green Mountain Care Board that Chair Foster presented to our governing board meeting here at in March. So this was something we knew, uh, but this number is is really um, really hits us hard. And we know a lot of that care is tertiary care that we can't provide. But we also know that one of our goals has to be to bring our local community patients back for the care that we can provide that's most appropriate. So we'll be talking a little bit about our strategy to do just that. 
and um, as we as we move forward now. Um, again, and we continue to be a partner in population health strategies. You know, we participate in the ACO. Um, ACO and um, are working with one care to reduce ED utilization in our marketplace. And we've seen we've seen some improvement in that particular metric. Um, and we are a strong economic contributor to the community. We have 379 people on our payroll and um, you know it's a huge economic impact here in our our area of Springfield. So um, moving to slide two, this is a um, slide from the analysis and um, our team found the um, comparative analytical data to be very helpful for us this year. Um, Clearly, we didn't have as much time to study this as we would have liked in advance of the budget, but uh, we, the data really was, really was eye-opening for us. And in most cases, it substantiated what we hypothesized to begin with. And so in this slide, I just want to show how we fare in terms of cost, um, allowable cost, and how, we're, how much of allowable cost we're reimbursed for the different payers. And you can certainly see that our commercial outpatient is um, is very important to us because we're about break even on Medicare, covering a lot of our fixed cost, and then Medicaid, um, we're below our allowable cost lines there. So we thought this slide was really important. And it also, I think, is important to draw a comparison here about when patients from our primary service area, and in the previous slide, we just showed that that was $176 million worth of care. Um, that, that we're very cost competitive. So if we can move more of that care back to our hospital and be local, we think that that's going to increase affordability and benefit our patients in our service area and in, in the marketplace here. The next slide, please. So um, again, sustainability remains our goal. It's been a slow climb back from our hospital being so vulnerable, uh, but we are making progress even though uh, even though it's been a slow climb in, in quite a few steps. So we are working to respond to the needs identified in our community health needs assessment. Uh, those three priorities were cost, access, and mental health and substance abuse. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we are the inpatient mental health provider for our geography with our Wyndham Center. Um, talk a little bit about access, particularly uh, we are doing a lot of work around specialty care access, and we believe a lot of that out migration is being is being driven by things that, you know, providers and care that's not accessible in the community now. So we're doing work to recruit and bring more of those providers back into the marketplace. Um, so people will have options here locally for those type of specialties uh, that we have had a shortages of. And, and we also are pretty proud of our, our FQHC partner here in town. They are also experiencing quite a bit of success recruiting primary care providers now as well. They have eight new providers joining them this year, and six of them are primary care providers. And we believe that's going to also improve accessibility and address needs on our community health needs assessment, which, by the way, we partner with them. So we do it with our FQHC. So they're looking at the same data we are in in mapping their strategic direction as well. Um, we know that we have a lot of ongoing operational transformation that are opportunities for us. Um, you know, in, right now we're in the midst of a financial assistance review, which we think is going to be important, particularly with the Medicaid unwind that is, is we're being faced with here in our marketplace. Um, we're looking into what are the access barriers, and in a lot of cases it's it, here we believe it's been access to uh, providers and specialty care and technology. And we're working on all three of those things. And again, we're collaborating quite, quite a bit on mental health and substance abuse. Our clinical providers meet monthly with our, um, our community partner on mental health. And um, so basically we have a three-part system here. We have HCRS that is our community resource. The FQHC has the behavioral medicine outpatient practice as part of their clinic, and we provide the inpatient psychiatry in the service area. So um, we work closely with those partners, particularly on specific cases 
you know, making sure the right patient is in the right place for care at the right time so that they get the most benefit. Um, and again, our sustainability, uh, our work is ongoing with this and uh, it, it's our priority that we work on every day. So um, next slide, please. So again, our sustainability journey has been a lot of little steps, but we're continuing to walk up the, the staircase. Um, we have a very challenging healthcare environment, as do all of our colleague hospitals in Vermont and then across America. Uh, it seems like every day you read a headline about another hospital having difficulties either with their sustainability or that they're having to reduce or change their service mix. Uh, even though it might be needed in the community, they may not be able to afford to maintain it. So this is not just a Springfield or a Vermont problem, it's a national problem. But I mean, we are a small hospital, so we're very diligent about managing our ongoing daily expenses and making sure we have the right resources available for our patients every day. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we do a lot of collaboration, particularly tactically with our FQHC, HCRS, in Turning Point, which is a substance abuse provider here in our marketplace. So we do a lot of tactical work, particularly with individual patients to make sure that everyone is getting the right care. Um, we're working with the ACO and of course, um, our partnership with tertiary providers. You know, we have a great relationship um, in terms of where we send people that we can't take care of. Although I've got to say in this past year, we've seen a lot more patients be referred to areas that are less familiar to us, like Albany, uh, Hartford, and even a couple of cases have gone to Boston due to availability of beds uh, or, or lack thereof in our in our area. Um, so our strategy for the for this business plan really focuses around rebuilding ser the services that we need to bring patients back to our hospital. And during the last year, we've increased coverage in podiatry and in urology. And partic of particular importance, uh, we have brought on two full-time gynecologists, which are now in growth modes with their practice, um, because you know we lost a lot of that volume when our childbirth center was closed a few years ago. So uh, we're not going to return to obstetrics, but we still have a lot of, of, of gynecology primary medicine that is needed in our marketplace. And our two practices are getting very busy um, we're also adding a part-time urogynecologist that's going to come on a part-time basis to do some cases that now must be referred out of our service area. Those are cases that we can do here with the right coverage. Um, we've added hours in urology, um, and we have a lot of good news over in general surgery. We have added um, two permanent part-time providers to our surgical panel, and uh, just this week we have agreed to bring another full-time surgeon into our hospital, which has been an area that has been a challenge for us in recruitment over the last couple of years. So we feel like we're having success in general surgery. Uh, had a little bit of a setback in cardiology. Uh, Dartmouth had a cardiologist here who was an outstanding provider. He relocated uh, due to family concerns out of our area, and we were working with other partners to restore that service. I believe that we will be successful in doing that on a part-time basis. And then, as I mentioned, our primary care provider is um, is having a lot of success uh, filling their open positions as well. I put diagnostic imaging on here. Um, we have a lot of opportunity in imaging because a lot of our equipment has aged out during the last five or six years while the hospital has had financial difficulties. So we're we're upgrading our MRI. Uh, we're reinstating our nuclear medicine uh, program because our nuclear med scanner um, was ready for the medical museum. And so now we're replacing that. Um, on MRI, our urology group alone referred 150 MRI scans out of the service area last year for urology MRI that we were not able to do. And we will be able to do that with the new scan Enter, as well as some other scans that we can't do now. Um, and then I guess over on the operational side, we're doing a lot of work on our revenue cycle, and that starts with patient access and a review of our financial assistance process uh, to make sure that we're 
we were identifying patients and qualifying them for assistance that's, that is available and to make sure that we're getting the right information on admission. And a lot of this is also about um, just best practices and making sure we're running the hospital like we should in terms of, of capturing all the charges, making sure we have the right clinical documentation, the right coding, and that uh, we're, we're able to successfully manage um, our revenue cycle appeal denials and, and, and prevail in those denials. So those those are big operational issues that are we're working on right now. Next slide, please. I want to go back, you know, we saw earlier how much volume is leaving our marketplace. And you know, we know we know a lot of that is tertiary, but we also know there's a lot of uh, appropriate care that can be provided in a critical access hospital that we are not taking care of. And we put this slide up because I know a lot of times we talk about our our volume projections being optimistic for our hospital. And when we I wanted to bring this slide in because I wanted you to see what our volume numbers were five or six years ago. And you can see that we had a lot of a lot more medical inpatient admissions. Of course there were child birth and child care center emissions in there that we don't do now. Um, but you can see that inpatient admissions, emergency room visits, um, operating room, um, all, surgery office visits, uh, ortho, I mean, go go down the list. Um, everything, we just about everything we do, we did a lot more of this five or six years ago before the hospital had financial troubles and before we had COVID. And we think the numbers demonstrate clearly that this volume is still in our marketplace. It's we just are not capturing it. So um, that's going to be one of our directions this year is to put those assets in place that are needed for us to perform the care that is appropriate for us in this setting and to bring those patients back. Uh, next slide, please. Just so you can see what's happened since our last budget cycle, you can see we've made uh, great strides in all of our key metrics, except for inpatient admissions. And you know that one, that one we know that less people are being admitted as inpatients. Uh, just so you'll know that 25% that we're below budget only is 16 patients a day. So it's it's um, not a big number because all of our numbers are small, but but um, that's a number we're working on as well to make sure people are being admitted appropriately. Our emergency room, um, we admit about 7% of the people we see, which is a very uh, good number. It's, it's a more aggressive number, lower than most other critical access hospitals. So, um, so you can see- I just, that, wanted, I just wanted to correct you, Bob, and saying 16 patients a day, it's actually 16 patients a month. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry, thank you, Katie. I get a little carried away when I get on a roll here. Uh, I'm passion, pretty passionate about about what we're doing and what we're what we're planning to do. So you can see that uh, we are are moving the dial in many of these areas. Uh, not still where we would like to see it see it be, but uh, we're still walking up that staircase. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as we move forward, again, we're going to keep on being very aggressive with our expense management areas. Our expenses were actually down year over year, except for travelers, which was which was the big glaring area. Uh, this is probably not a new story. You probably heard that from our colleague hospitals as well. Um, primary care access challenges hit our community health needs assessment every time we do it. Um, our FQHC partner is doing a lot of work to restore that. Uh, accessibility with their recruitment and again build, rebuilding that com community confidence and letting people know that the hospital is on the road to recovery and that, that they, they should come back. Um, our adult their daycare program took a lot of volume reductions during COVID because we had uh, restrictions with how many patients we could see in the area and so now we're building that back. Um, lots of ongoing workforce challenges uh, we have a 2% cost of living adjustment budgeted in here, um, which, uh, you know, we, it is very costly for us to try to remain competitive in the salary, wages, and benefits area. So we're doing as well as we can with our tight margins to do that. 
post-acute placement. I know all of our colleague hospitals have a lot of trouble with post-acute um, placements. We do too. Um, doesn't feel like it is disruptive with us as it has been with some of our colleagues. Um, one thing we have seen a lot of this last year is uh, difficulty with tertiary placements to our, our normal partners that takes those because of their capacity. And as I mentioned earlier, quite a few patients have gone out of the service area, you know, to Albany, Hartford, Boston, those kind of places because there weren't beds available close, closer. And a um, byproduct issue that that is raised is availability of medical uh, emergency transportation. So if we transfer somebody it's a two hour trip. It's it. Sometimes we have a challenge getting an EMS crew that can to can do that transport for us. Um, and then disruptors, you know, there are always going to be disruptors in the marketplace. We've certainly seen our primary care partner at the FQHC reports that they have seen a lot of conversion, um, you know, to telemedicine, um, particularly during ski season when we have a lot of guests in our region. Um, and you know we're not sure what's going to happen otherwise you know will amazon get in healthcare in our area so anyway we're always on concerned about people that will disrupt um, the marketplace as we know it today next slide please um again this is kind of what we've been saying we're we're still focusing every day all the things we're doing are around our community health needs assessment which is increase access and uh, our collaboration with our primary care partner. As you recall, we don't have any primary care providers as part of our system. They all work for our uh, FQHC partner who was previously before chapter 11 was our owner, as you, as you remember. Uh, so now we're, we're not, we don't have an ownership relationship, but we continue to be close partners and, close, and coordinate very closely all the time. And so we want to work on increasing awareness of our local services, particularly as we add the surgical specialists that have been in such short supply in our area. Um, our two big growth areas this year are going to be in general surgery and gynecology, and we actually have those providers recruited now. So these are not plans we're talking about doing or wanting to do. These are plans we have done, and we're just getting to doctors on board now. Um, our revenue cycle improvement. Again, these are best practices that we need to be doing to improve, you know, how we charge and bill for our services and, and collect those. Um, grow, continuing to grow inpatient in our psychiatric program. Pursue grant funding, which has been a huge plus for us the last couple of years as we've gone through our turnaround mode. The grant funding has been very important for us. And then continuing our expense management like we do every day. Um, recruitment, and again, rec specialty recruitment is really important because if we bring a general surgeon on that is a member of our hospital family, you know, that is much less expensive than us paying a third party for locums coverage. Um, plus, that doctor will be in our community and be, will be building a practice rather than just uh, covering emergency calls. Um, travelers, they're on everybody's mind. How do we reduce those? And we're, we're working on both on the recruitment side and renegotiating those contracts and lowering the cost of what we are paying for those. And then recruitment and training for our own staff. Uh, we were, were very successful. Someone recruited our recruiter a couple of years ago, and we were successful in re-recruiting our recruiter to come back. And so now that's starting to pay some um, turnaround. That, that's paying some dividends for us right now. So um, she's been with us since uh, early summer, and we're now starting to see um, see the recruiting pick up because we have a full-time asset devoted to that. Next slide, please. And again, you know, just to clarify, you've seen our proposal. Um, our charge increase is 6.9%. We know we're ahead of the two-year target, but we want to point out that most of our NPR increase this year is utilization and not commercial charge increase. So we've only asked for the absolute minimum that we thought we needed, and we're relying heavily on growth and bringing our own patients back that, that are in our market and, you know, providing the, the assets to do that. 
So with that, that concludes our introduction. I appreciate it, a chance to uh, be able to tell our story at the beginning. So thank you, board members. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. And Sarah, <laughs> no, go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> All right. Uh, that sounds great. So we'll uh, go over the review tool. Let me just uh, change my presentation screen. <clears throat> All right. Um, so thank you for your opening remarks. Uh, I think you covered, uh, presupposed some of the questions I was going to have, but um, we see here that um, <clears throat> among critical access hospitals, Springfield's uh, operating expense growth at 6.4% is uh, among the lowest of uh, the critical access hospitals in this time period. Um, and I just was curious uh, to hear a little bit more about how um, some of that support in financial assistance review might be um, contributing to some of that expense growth uh, trajectory. Well, I'll start off by saying, you know, uh, we work very closely with our community partner here, Valley Health, uh, which is Valley Health. We're very closely with them on the financial assistance side. And um, I'm gonna let Kata speak to the uh, financial assistance policy um, and the work we're doing around that because we wanna make sure that we get people identified and get them the help they need in our, our service area because there is quite a bit of help available. Hi. Um, we are going to be doing some work um, coming up next month with um, we've we're going to be working with a third party vendor to review our financial assistance policy um, and also to our current policy and also what that looks like um, moving to Act 119 so that we're in compliance with that policy um, by July of next year. Um, we think we're going to see with moving to that policy um, more people um, eligible for free care. Um, right now, our um, the highest income level that a uh, patient can be eligible for free care is at the 300% level. Um, with it, Act 119, um, that's going to raise that level to 400%. So there's about there's the 300 to 400% income level range that we're not capturing right now in our policy. Um, so moving to that Act 119, I think our policy will be more generous. Um, and we're working, um, we work very closely with Valley Health Connections um, who helps patients um, apply for financial assistance. Um, they help patients enroll in insurance, whether it be Medicaid um, or on the Vermont um, Health Exchange. Um, and they're also heavily helping us um, with the Medicaid unwind patients as well. Uh, that's great. So apologies because I uh, misunderstood. I thought the financial assistance was directed to Springfield Hospital, but you're talking about financial assistance for your patients. So uh, I got that question was probably very confusing. So um, so two things I'd like to follow up on there is, um, you know, just uh, anything that you found particularly helpful in that expense management, because um, I'm particularly interested in your comment that you know, nationally hospitals are working on this tension of not providing the services that they want to just because of these um, financial constraints. So kind of how you're balancing that and how that's um, going down to your expense line uh, as you tackle these very difficult uh, conditions. Well, that, you know, thank you for asking that, Sarah. I think for, for our standpoint, you know, the hospital has been through these four or five years of very challenging financial times. And so we have been forced to manage the hospital very uh, conservatively during that time. Um, we have we have made quite a few expense reductions. And now those are arm wrestling most days with uh, inflation and some of the other factors that we can't control. Obviously, a place where we've had a lot of additional expenses this year have been in contract labor. Um, we've had uh, inflation around virtually everything we use in the hospital, and we've had to make increases in our wages to remain competitive. So I think that what we continue to do is just manage every dollar very aggressively every day. And, um, you know, uh, 
So, I mean, I don't, I think we're just, uh, I think I think we've just conditioned everybody here to be very cautious about every everything we spend. So we're just uh, and so now we're looking at at how do we reinvest? You know, what reinvestment do we need to to grow the hospital back to where it was before? And that's why we're investing in the recruitment of the providers. We're starting to replace aging equipment. And we've been very fortunate with some of the grants we have because we have several major uh, building projects going on that are primarily being funded by uh, grants we were successful in getting. And so we're trying to also update the building and keep the building up as updated as possible too. But I think we're just, uh, we just uh, are very, very, uh, it's very tough to get anything approved, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh just back to the uh, unwinding that's been a topic how did you kind of uh, approach that uh puzzle of uh what's going to happen with uh, the redeterminations well, you're, you're I can speak to that are you okay. referring Sarah in terms of the budget or yeah yeah general? for the yeah for the fiscal year 24 assumptions yeah okay yeah so our assumptions was that there there was going to be no impact um basically we assumed the same pair mix um, mainly due to the unpredictability of how many of those patients would either be re-enrolled in Medicaid, um, enroll in Medicare, or be eligible for Medicare or commercial insurance, or you know, go to private pay or not be insured. So it's really it was really so unpredictable that we we just assumed the same payer mix. So basically, no impact in our budget. Okay. Um, and so uh, we'll move on to uh, the factors here. So um, the cost inflation was within benchmarks. Um, and just turning to labor for a second, um, I believe we've uncovered that uh, this is uh, essentially uh, not meaningful because uh, the FTEs have not been updated in our system uh, for a few years. So um, I just want to uh, let's get that up to date so we can look at this <laughs> more appropriately. But um, I think you kind of covered your approach to um, uh, trying to manage labor. Anything else you wanted to highlight in terms of the 24 budget uh, related to labor? Hey, to any any. Um, I don't have anything to add. I mean, when we were looking at um, this, the budget tool for labor, we noticed that we were kind of in the middle of the pack as the other hospitals um, in terms of our own budget, you know, that lab labor is increasing, obviously, due to, um, you know, our, our COLA of 2%, um, market adjustments, um, we have the collective bargaining unit. unit. Um, I think those are like the the major increases to our to our budget next year for wages. Um, yeah. We also have some FTEs that are coming over um, from the FQHC onto the hospital. That was part of the shared services agreements. Yeah, what will the functions of those positions be? Ooh, I just froze. <laughs> no worries. We can hear you now. Yeah. Can you hear us? Yeah. Yep. Okay. The positions that are coming over for shared services, what's the nature of those positions? Those are IT positions. And they'll Technology still be management. serving the, the FQHC. You're able to um, provide that. Those are now going to be serving just primarily the hospital where in the past um, it was a shared service where IT was employed by the FQHC and shared services um, with the hospital. Now they're having their own staff, and then um, some of those staff are, are coming onto the hospital as full-time FTEs. This is more kind of that splitting process. Correct. Um, okay, yeah. understood. Thank you. Um, and as far as utilization goes, uh, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head, and uh, I'm glad that that you found some of this useful. Um, as you, you know, you you do see quite a bit of dollars uh, leaving the Springfield. Uh, service area. Now, not all of those dollars that stay are, ne are necessarily going to Springfield Hospital. Uh, we know that's, you know, that just means the provider is in the same HSA. So I would just say, you know, um, since you are finding some utility in this, uh, if there's, you know, further breakouts that might be helpful, I think our data team would, you know, be interested in ways they can make it uh, 
more more useful to folks like you um, and others, not just you. <laughs> uh, and then when we go to the cost report section, uh, we see that um, Springfield is among uh, you know the the right around the 25th percentile in terms of size and. Due to the limitations of the tool, you're hidden in a few places, but uh, we know your case mix index, I believe, is hiding right behind North Country here at about 1.3. So um, given that you're, um, you know, when you adjust that, then you're the uh, one among the lowest uh, in the, I think you're actually hiding behind North Country at 10,000 there. So seeing that that um, relatively higher acuity and providing at a lower cost. So um, you had mentioned that kind of confirmed some of your suspicions. So what led you to uh, the, the suspicion that you might be a low cost provider in your area? Well, I, th I think, Sarah, it's more of a comparative, more of a comparative thing because, you know, um, you know, we we know we send a lot of care out of our market area for tertiary things that we are not going to do that won't be appropriate for us to do. I don't see that really changing, um, but you know there are a lot of cases that in that are appropriate for critical access that we could take care of, and I think we can do it uh, better, faster, and cheaper. And you know, and when we look at the hospital slide of you know what are the costs of at at the other hospitals you know where most of our tertiary referrals go you know those costs are going to be a lot higher in an academic center than in a um critical access hospital so. yeah um and you know you have one of the more favorable um you know ibidars per uh, adjusted discharge um so you know that is might be argued as one measure of um you know potential efficiency or, or profitability. So, um, you know, that seems like a really strong result given where you are in your chapter 11 recovery um, and also doing it with a, you know, relatively small amount of cash on hand. Um, you know, I know that you're kind of focused on trying to rebuild uh, some of that uh, cash uh, for investment and whatnot. So kind of what, how are you thinking about that in the long term to kind of get back to a more comfortable place for your cash on hand? I'll, I'll pull that up here in a minute. Yeah, it sounds like it will come with the volume. Is that is that the fair assessment? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Any let, any other? Oh, go ahead. Kate is, Kate is the uh, mastermind on the cash forecast model, but I mean, obviously, if if as we focus on strengthening our margins and and growing our service lines and improve our operations, we think those things will all contribute to to strengthening our our cash position. Okay, thank you. Um, and then don't want to miss the uh, admin ratio. So this is one where uh, some, you know, we've heard some uh, comments about some, maybe the limitations of that data source. And I believe you are also hiding behind someone here, aren't you? You're right at the around that 21%. Um, so yeah, it does, uh, th you know, that would be right with these other hospitals uh, on the lower end, I would say, um, of the kind of, hospitals around your size. So, um, you know, and apologies, you just happen to uh, be hidden on a lot of these uh, variables. So we'll kind of work on that process improvement. Um, and then I think you highlighted a lot of what I was uh, hoping to address on the cost coverage in terms of um, seeing that pretty uh, tough result uh, of not having the inpatient costs uh, covered. Also see that, um, you know, when I see those dips in 2020, um, years I'm guessing would be not impacted not only by COVID, but also the chapter 11, is that accurate? Um, Sarah, some of that 11 dip might also um, be when we had the, the Wyndham Center offline. Right. Because remember, we used it for the state COVID behavioral med facility for a while. And during that time, we were receiving like grant income from the state. Basically, it was kind of like a standby fee. So, so we weren't we weren't booking net patient revenue. It was we, it was more like a I think we booked it like a grant. Um, but in my mind, it was more like being paid an on call fee because it was so we would have the facility available as needed. Did I do right. that right, Kater? Did I explain that? 
Yeah, in the last half of fiscal year 20 and in the first six months of fiscal year 21 is when the, the psych unit was just um, for COVID patients, of which we only had about one patient a day, if less than that. Um, and we did receive grant funding for the state um, basically to subsidize um, the the program with it being reduced to just to about a patient a day. So, so it wouldn't and be my, reflected in claims or it would, yeah. it was just a grant income. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Um, and then last but not least, just, I think Rand uh, analysis, just showing again that, uh, you know, if we take all your commercial payments and, and scale that by a, a standardized unit of service that um, Springfield is, relatively low uh, reimbursement relative to other cause at um, 15,000 per discharge uh, inpatient and 277 outpatient, which is near the 25th percentile. So, um, you know, doing doing a lot with relatively less compared to some of your comparators in that analysis. So that is what I had, uh, ch uh, Acting Chair Lunge, if you want to take it from here. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so we're going to move to board questions next, and I'm going to ask Dr. Merman to start, please. Okay, thanks. Um, my questions are not super well organized by theme, so I'm sorry if they kind of jump from place to place a little bit today. Um, one of the questions that I have for you re regarding your um, budget submission is you were talking about uh, your also in your community needs assessment was discussed the need for more specialty care that's easily accessible in your region. Um, and you've discussed increasing your access to gynecologic care, general surgery, podiatry, uh, urology. Um, are there other challenges with cardiology? Um, yeah, are there yeah. other areas that you could see um, your community needs over the next couple of years that you'd be interested in trying to recruit towards the, that are beyond this budget submission? Well, one of one of those, uh, Dr. Marmon, would be oncology because we did have a very um, good satellite program with, with um, Dartmouth. Um, and then there, they were forced to uh, move those providers back to the main hospital. And we were still, some of those patients are still being seen at our location via telemedicine. But I mean, that is one, um, you know, that's one of the areas that, that we would like to have that back because it's so hard for that patient population to travel for, for you know, infusion therapy. But as far as other specialties, I think these are things we're just having to research. I mean, we do have a good bit of out-migration among many of the medicine subspecialty physicians as well. Um, you know, do we have enough to have a part-time provider where patients can be seen in Springfield? We're doing research on that in several of the medicine subspecialty areas right now. Um, okay. So just to, my, actually, my next question was about oncology. So maybe I'll pick that up and then expand a little bit more on that first question. But um, so it looked like you have this telemedicine and then you, you, I thought you mentioned that you do have infusion services, but are you saying that the patients that receive telemedicine from Dartmouth get their infusion services outside of the area? There are some limited services we're able to provide here. Um, and some of the physician visits are done via telemedicine because the patient's either can't get to the doctor or they don't have access to, you know, to broadband uh, internet at their at their home. And so they can come here and do a telemedicine visit, which is more convenient. And so we do have some limited oncology and limited infusion, but it's greatly reduced from what we used to have because we did have a, we did have a provider coming every week before. Okay. And then if uh, a patient so, we, so so some and we're giving some other infusions that are not oncology, you know, some other, you know, infusion type therapy in that center as well that are not okay. chemo agents. Yeah. And and if a patient needs radiation therapy, do they where would who lives in your Springfield region, where would they have to go to receive radiation therapy for say cancer treatment? Most of those patients would go to Dartmouth, although a few do go to Rutland, I think. Okay. So, just because I, I was just thinking about that because you know that's you know often these patients will have Monday through Friday 
sessions for six weeks in a row. It's a huge transportation burden. I don't imagine you had radiation therapy prior to no, no, 2020. We no, we just did trying not. to understand the, the complexities of travel from patients from your area. Yeah, so we had so those patients, you know, go to Dartmouth, they go to Cheshire, you know, um, but we have not ever done radiation therapy. So we don't I'm not I don't foresee enough demand to do that here to to do that. So and before I go back to the first question, the other question I had on um, patient travel from your area is is our dialysis patients do. Are you able to, do you have uh, outpatient dialysis in the Springfield area or do people have to travel for that as well three days a week? Uh, they have to travel for that. We do not, we do not have a chronic center in Springfield and we do not do any acute in the hospital. We're, do you know where the closest outpatient dialysis center? I wouldn't think you would do acute. We're pretty limited in acute inpatient dialysis beds in the region, but for, for outpatient dialysis, is that, do you know where the closest center would be at a Springfield? Um, Maybe Claremont. Okay. So across the river, but uh, yeah, not having to go all the way up to to Dartmouth or. I would I would think it would be it would be probably a lot of those patients go to Dartmouth or Cheshire. I would think. Okay. And with regards to the other services from the community needs assessment or other assessments, I, I had a question for you regarding your inpatient volumes. Are there specific service uh, specialty services that would allow you to keep patients at Springfield Hospital uh, as opposed to transferring to a tertiary medical center just because they need consultation from a specific service are there are there are there any services that if you could expand would allow you to keep more inpatients appropriately of course mm -hmm. at Springfield Hospital as opposed to need to transfer them for I, I don't know a endocrinology consultation or an ID consultation or a, something of that sort. I mean, I would think I would without any data because I don't have data on this, but just me okay. guessing, I think the two areas that would allow us to keep more patients would probably be to have a cardiologist here all the time and to have pulmonology here all the time. Okay. Because when we had cardiology, it was a clinic. It was a clinic-based service. He was here one day a week. Great program, great doctor. It was a big loss to us when we lost him. Um, but um, you know, I would think those would be the two biggies. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I asked the question from the perspective that you know, there are, the tertiary centers are just having a really hard time managing the large volumes of transfers in, and the, your story of having to transfer patients out of the region is is a is a common narrative mm -hmm. that we're hearing and if, if there's any and it, it appears you actually have bed space there to, to keep more patients and compare it to your prior volume so yeah that's that was sort of the the um, the basis for that inquiry we have we have beds the challenge of course is the staffing and uh, we're we are working over on the recruitment side but that's uh that's a a tough a tough you know thing to move right now but I would think it would be cardiology and pulmonology, just me without any without any objective data to prove that. That would be my speculation. Okay. Uh, I guess one more question I have written down on uh, regards to the sort of this theme of patients having to trans travel out of the area for care. And, and, and again, this is really just with an un trying to understand what is or isn't available and what the burden is on, on patients who live in the area. But, but births, um, if, if a do you know where the closest hospital or the few closest hospitals that patients who live in the Springfield area go for, for childbirth now that you are unable to provide obstetric services anymore? Well, there's there's four hospitals that are that are in the region. Uh, none of them are particularly close. So it would be Dartmouth, Rutland, Cheshire, or Brattleboro. And um, you know those those would be the closest ones. Although I would I would have to also guess that a lot of the OB is going to Dartmouth as well. Okay. Or Cheshire, I would think. In the in the southern part of our market, like the Bellows Falls area, you know, a lot of those patients do go to Brattleboro or to Cheshire. Um, when we spoke earlier this year at the, the mid-year kind of update, which was really informative and I appreciated that discussion, 
I think there was some discussion about this new designation of a rural emergency hospital. And I, I must admit, I don't remember the details of our discussion from that time. A, a lot has transpired from them and I didn't review my notes, but uh, have you re reviewed this um, designation and the sort of potential benefits or or alterations that would, would have come with this with this designation? Well, we we haven't uh, we haven't um, worked on that a lot because particularly particularly back in in that time there was still some ambiguity about what the standards were going to be. Um, however, you know we think if we 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 don't what from what we think about that now we don't think that that would be an appropriate transition for this hospital due to the volume that we have here because right now we're we're averaging about 35 ER visits a day and um, you know our inpatient census with observation in swing beds is is probably around all all heads in the bed are probably about 10. If we were a rural emergency hospital all those patients would have to be transferred somewhere else and we wouldn't also be able we do about a hundred you know, we're trying to do surgery that's appropriate as well here. We wouldn't be able to do any of those cases. We wouldn't be able to do, you know, we would basically just be an emergency room and a holding area under those standards. You know, the standards of, as I understand them for that classification of hospital. And, and can I just throw out like a hypothetical question, which say, for instance, that you were to change to a rural emergency hospital. Do you have any idea of what the transportation availability would be to transport 10 patients? At, at 10, I mean, it's not 10 admissions a day, but it'd be 10, 10 admissions uh, to other hospitals or those surgical volume to other hospitals. Do, do, you have, do you have transportation in your area or do you have any idea of what the, the transportation burden would be to do something like that? Well, we I know it would be it would be very high because the 911 in our community is run by our partners at the Springfield Fire Department. They do a fantastic job, but they are also really, you know, in terms of of capacity and recruitment, you know, they're able to run 911 for our our town. But I mean, if if the emergency transportation requirements, if we were a a, a, a rural emergency hospital, it would have to be much different than it is now, and that would be quite costly. You know, there would be a lot of money involved to subsidize that type of system. Okay. Don't know what the, don't know what the specific dollars would be. I mean, somebody probably knows what an average cost of an EMS unit on the road is. I don't have that. I don't know what that is, but it's a lot. Yeah. And the problem a lot of the EMS providers have had too, by the way, has been staffing and recruitment as well. So we have some providers that are willing. But they don't have the staff to, to. They don't have the staff. And a transport here in Springfield would 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 take that unit offline for a 911 transfer. Um, one question that, um, that that brings up, which sort of relates back to to your hospital uh, this function, is the staffing recruitment. One thing that we've heard from a lot of different hospitals is just the, basically the lack of availability of housing and how that has really been challenging. I mean, this is actually not just a Vermont issue. This is an entire regional issue. Friends in Boston, uh, California, a lot of people say the same thing, that there's just no housing, so you can't recruit somebody. And everywhere in the country, the interest rates are high, the rents are high, so nobody wants to move. Um, a lot of hospitals, have had grow your own nursing, other tech programs. I understand that you've gone through this massive restructuring and a lot of financial challenges over the last couple of years. But do you, do you have had any opportunities to have grow your own? Uh, and I use that in sort of in air quotes, you know, staff development programs within Springfield Hospital to try to, um, you know, uh, provide economic opportunities for people who live in your area. Mm -hmm career advancement that are already connected to the area, probably mm -hmm. already have housing in the area. Is that something you've been able to do and, and why, why not? How's it going? What are your thoughts? Well, we all, 
we are doing it and we're looking to expand doing that. I mean, we have partnerships with several of the local programs with uh, River Valley Tech Center. Uh, we've had partnership with our nursing assistant program with them. Uh, we also collaborate with AHEC on their tra training and recruitment. Um, and right now we, ha we, are, we have two R RN new grads working in our emergency room that we are uh, we have them on a uh, program for them to be ER nurses. So they're in a um, um, development program. Great. I, I think. Yeah. So we're doing as much of that as as we can. Um, you know, we haven't. We've obviously have some challenges around how much money we have, but uh, we would like to do more. We would like to do more of those partnerships and and help more people that are native to our area stay here and be trained. Yeah. Um, I think another thing that probably came up when we spoke in the spring, and I, I was wondering if you have any updates and thoughts of it, is there's just generally speaking a fair amount of discussion around the state for the need of geriatric psychiatry inpatient admissions and the significant burden that this has on other hospitals. And for some reason, Springfield often comes up in these conversations, which mm -hmm. um, I guess there's some thought that you may have capacity for for something like this. I guess my questions are within this topic is, you know, what are your thoughts on this topic? And and is there a model of financial sustainability within inpatient geriatric psychiatry that Springfield could envision? Well, you know, that, that's a good point that you bring up. We've had discussions about, um, you know, our, should our program be focused on geriatric psych, and that's something we have discussed and looked at. Haven't reached a conclusion on that. Uh, one of the barriers we've had to it is, you know, our, again, our psychiatric unit is on another campus, not at the main hospital, and so it's the it's uh, providing the medical support that those patients might need. You know, like having an internist or a gerontologist available. You know, to round on those on those patients as needed. Um, but no, it is something we've looked at. And um, we've also, you know, thought that we possibly could have a larger psychiatric program, except for the fact that as a critical access hospital, we're the maximum we can have is 10 beds. Yeah. You know, so, um, so yeah, we've and talked that, about that. that. And, and, okay, so, I know there's a lot of rules around inpatient psychiatry facilities, and because your facility is off campus, you're saying that still counts for the 10 patient capacity that you could have without a waiver. Correct. Correct. It's a distinct part unit. It just happens to be located in Bellows Falls. So it's about, I think, 15 miles from the main hospital. So it's within the radius. So it, you know, meets the licensure requirements. But it's um, it's you know we don't it's not the, we don't have the same level of medical support at that facility as if it were a unit in the main building. Okay. Um, but no, we would we 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 this is a discussion, uh, doctor, that we haven't uh, reached a conclusion on yet. We're still talking about it. Okay. Uh, let me just think. I think I had one one or two more. Which was oh this um nuke med uh, imaging study numbers I assume that's mostly nuclear stress tests on that graph from twenty or the chart from twenty eighteen to twenty twenty four budget twenty twenty three you had up earlier it was what about a nine hundred or seven hundred or something down to three hundred. Yeah, we have a we have a pretty conservative projection in year one. I think it's about two scans a working day, which we think we will actually should do more than that. And Kata, can you comment on the mix? There is a fair amount of nuclear cardiology in there. I'm not sure what the split was. Kata was the developed the uh, projections for it. I don't have the the mix in front of me. I'd have to get back to you on that. Um, but when we were looking at the nuke med tech test from 2018 and what is projected for next year. We've been offline for nuke med um, probably for about three years now um, due to our outdated equipment. So we're getting a new machine. I want to say I think it's next month or in the next couple of months. And so we're starting that service back up again. 
in this next fiscal year. And so we're being conservative in our budget and um, budgeting about two patients a day, which we think is conservative. Um, we think it's going to be a lot more than that. But I don't have the mix of of what um, whether it's stress tests or or what it is in front of me. I was just part of me was wondering about that because it sounds like you don't have cardiology access right now. So I was trying to figure out if if those projections affect, are affected by not having a, an available provider to read it, or if it can be kind of like a VRAD, like a, a remote read for a stress test. Yeah, those will be those will be those will be read um, electronically off site, and we've we've had quite a bit of conversation with our emergency room group. You know, the absence of cardiology we do not believe will affect those projections. Okay. And then we I guess my, my one... We've talked about that quite a bit. All right. Yeah. And my one last question kind of relates back to our budget tool that your operating expenses are quite low uh, increase compared to other hospitals. Your NPR FPP has grown a lot compared, which looks like utilization and returning to trying to kind of um, regain trust within your community that you've discussed. Um, mm -hmm. Your day's cash on hand is low, um, and your rate request uh, asks for essentially a break-even budget with no margin. Um, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, did, did you consider, you know, similar hospitals that that, that we've been reviewing have, have tried to factor in a margin of more than a hundred thousand dollars, you know, in a in a budget like this? Did you consider a, a higher rate request, and and why why not? Um, we went through, so we did, but we went through a process in the spring where we had um, um, a price um, sensitivity analysis done that looked at all of our charges um, at a charge level by payer, looking at the you know individual contracts that we have and what we could, what kind of an increase we could get out of those contracts. And so what we have for a rate increase of 6.95% is really probably the highest that we can really go um, without, you know, if we went for a higher rate increase, we really wouldn't be able to generate more um, reimbursement from that. So the 6.95% is kind of our maximum of what we could um, ask for, because um, I think we're pretty much capped in our contracts if we went much higher than that, so. Okay. Well, thank you, and thank you for your, um, your submission. I just wanted to call out one thing that I found very helpful. Uh, it was just your your um, your cost inflation uh, section was was quite brief, but it was very succinct and very easy to read, and I thought it was just very well written. So I just appreciated that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Merman. Uh, Board Member Walsh, do you have questions you'd like to ask? Thank you, acting chair. Just just a couple. Um, it, it's tough going after Dave. Uh, <laughs> um, the the rural emergency hospital designation, I you know, it's it's still emerging and coming um, to fruition. And I'm certainly not an expert, but I think there's added flexibility and added funding for transportation. Um, and so it it may be something to spend a little bit of time considering. Certainly, I'm I'm in no position to give any advice. Um, but I think as feedback has come to that um, program, um, it's been uh, modified and enhanced. And, and so it's just something to, to think about based on uh, the interaction with, with uh, Dr. Merman. Um, I agree that the section on cost inflation was very well written. I appreciated that. I also wanted to applaud your expense um, management efforts. It was interesting to listen to that because with our um, costs, well, we could certainly see it in the cost per adjusted discharge um, and in the RAND data. Um, and and um, I think you'd be applauded uh, for those efforts. It shows up back in that data. It'll be interesting um, to me and I think the rest of us to see how that moves forward. Um, I was um, hoping you might describe um, some of the steps you're taking to understand your community needs and how you're monitoring the impact of your efforts. Well, we, of course, just just did our 
our three year survey last fall. And so we ours ours is is pretty fresh, although I have to say that it's not a lot different than it, the one prior to that. I mean, what are people concerned about in our marketplace? It's the it's access. How are there going to be providers here for them? Um, what does it cost to access them? Um, and do we have what about mental health? If I need myself or someone I love needs mental health services, where can they get it? Um, so, I mean, our, ours really hasn't changed very much. Uh, we, the thing I will say is we're, we now that uh, the pandemic has subsided, we're spending time out in the community, attending community functions, engaging with other groups and those type of efforts. So we're getting a lot more feedback. And that's been particularly helpful for me because as you recall, I've been here now a little more than two years. And most of my first year to a year and a half, we were like quarantined. And so we were afraid to, for me to be roaming around talking to people. And so now I'm out a lot more and I'm, I'm you know, building relationships in the communities and getting to know people in, and giving, you know, having a chance to get input from people in the community. So um, I think our community needs uh, needs assessment mirrors what people are telling me um, and I think people want to seek care they want to receive care here because it's uh, it's more convenient it's easier you um, know our hospital is pretty easy to come in and out of if you need something um, yeah so yeah. We, are, we, are, we are doing that and I think we're planning some forums and some focus groups in the fall um, to um, to, to do some more listening because I think we need to look we need to have our ears open and listen more. Terrific. Yeah, that's that's um, where I imagined you'd be um, going. And so I'm really happy to hear about it because with the expect um, expense management that you you've done so well, right? That kind of the holy grail is if you can really target what your community needs while managing your expenses to deliver those the care that they need. Right. That's a that's going to be sustainable. Um, but if we're if we don't have a good at, um, handle on expenses and you're you're growing just in an attempt to continually grow, um, then things can get kind of out of hand and and um, get, uh, there's a mismatch with what your community may need or what it can afford. Um, and if if a community can't afford care, it won't be able to access even what's there. And if they can't access care because they can't afford it, then they stay away until it's desperately needed. Then they can't pay their bill. And so it becomes a sustain. The affordability is a sustainability issue. It's not a trade off. And so um, I, I applaud your efforts with expense management and um, really hope you hope you keep diving in um, to the community needs. And of course, we're, we've got the Act 167 rolling out and we want to understand what's going on in communities and help facilitate that process. But the, the focus groups, interviews um, and really trying to, to um, target efforts and maintaining your expect expense management. I just think you're on a good track if you can if you can keep doing those things. So thank you for presenting to us today. I appreciate all the work um, that you guys have been doing the last few years turning the ship around. Well, thank you. And I appreciate that compliment. And that is a compliment for our hospital family here because you know the the our hospital family they're very um very uh, um conservative with the money we spend, you know, they're very tight because <laughs> they know they know we've had financial troubles, and you know, if we have to spend money, they want to make sure that uh, everybody's very cognizant of that issue here. And so that is uh, a compliment to our hospital family. So thank you. You're welcome. Deserved. Great, thank you. Um, I'll turn now to board member Holmes. Great, thank you, and thank you for the presentation today. Um, just a, a couple of quick questions for you. Um, and I think some of them are follow-ups from some of my colleagues' uh, questions for you, but you, you have an inpatient unit that you staff for 15 beds, yet your average daily census is around seven to eight, it looks like from the narrative. So I'm wondering how many days a month does it exceed 10? 
Well, you know that, so we have one inpatient unit other than the psychiatry. And so right. on, that unit, on that unit, we have a lot of things going on, even though it's a small unit. So we have traditional inpatients there. Uh, we also have swing bed patients that are on that unit. And we have observation patients that are on that unit and patients that are going back and forth between all three of those categories, depending on what, what you know, what's going on with their condition and, um, and their payer. Um, and so, so we're managing that every day and we do have, you know, we have, we'll have patients that, you know, as the surgery numbers go up, most of our surgeries are outpatient. And when you look at our outpatient revenue, you can see that that really, that really stands out when you look at that over in the hospital report section. Um, however, we do have some people that stay as observations and we do have a small inpatient census budgeted as a mostly driven by uh, the increase in surgery that we've budgeted for this year. Uh, but I'm not sure if that answers your question. Well, I, I'm trying to understand why you staff for 15 when it looks like you're under 10 most days. I just don't know if that's, um, you know, are there, are think, there, is there volatility in those numbers such that you might have 12 some days and, and four other days? I'm trying to figure out why staff for 15 when you're under 10. Well, what's, what's happening is we're flexing that staff. So we, 15 is kind of the maximum amount we could go if we brought everybody in at once. But we, if if the inpatient census is low, we may float provider, you know, nurses and technicians from that staff. We may float those to the emergency room if they're busy, or we may float them somewhere else. And so there's a lot of flexing and um, adjustment go, that goes on. I mean, we may have somebody from one of the perioperative areas uh, that is ends up covering in the emergency room, for example, if we're short. So we moving people around quite a bit and our hospital family is pretty uh, they're pretty understanding and flexible of that so my hats off to our to our guys for doing it so so I would say that 15 is a maximum it's not a fixed number okay um and I guess you know a lot of our questioning is probably around the concerns there's a lot of financial vulnerabilities obviously that Springfield has experienced over the past two years so I do echo some of my colleagues questioning around the rural emergency hospital designation, just exploring that further. I think exploring Jerry Psych becoming a center of excellence for Jerry Psych is, is definitely worth exploring. Um, you know, we have significant needs in the state for post-acute placement. Obviously, your expertise in, in mental health and your excess, seemingly excess bed capacity seems like this would be an interesting avenue to explore. Um, I want to uh, ask a little bit about given the volumes that have been shrinking and you're already small size, do you have you established or do you follow any minimum volume requirements to ensure quality in the surgeries that you're doing? Are there minimum volume requirements that you have in place? For example, for knee replacements, for hip replacements, for other types of surgeries where we know that there's a volume quality relationship, do you have established minimum volumes? Well, we really, we really haven't done that. The orthopedic example you used is our busiest service, and usually we're doing uh, the two primary surgeons in that specialty are do about 25 surgeries combined a month, and so um, that's pretty big volume for us. Some months they might go up into the 30s during ski season. You know, um, that, those are usually our busier months. So the answer to the question is we haven't really done that. Uh, both the doctors we have are very tenured and very experienced. Um, so they're very, um, you know, their current competency to perform those surgeries is is very high. Okay. Um, let me ask another question uh, around, you mentioned uh, that one of the major contributors to fiscal year 24 other expenses was advertising and marketing. So I'm wondering if you could give us a little bit more detail on how much you're spending on advertising, marketing, why this is a significant other expense, um, what the need for it is. You could talk a well, bit about really that. Well, it's, really, it's kind of a, I'm not, I think it's really a relative measure because we really couldn't afford to do any marketing before. So we're reinstating some, some conservative marketing that we're doing. And a lot of that is focusing around letting people know what services we do have. For example, you know, uh, orthopedics, podiatry. You know, we didn't have a podiatrist 
in Springfield for a long time. And um, I think the provider will be here. He came part time around the holidays. I think that'll be two years during the holidays this year. So we didn't have a podiatrist. So we had to do some work to let people know that that service was here. Um, and so, but what we're doing is pretty conservative. And I would say it's a relative measure because we weren't able to afford to do any before. So Kata can speak to the to dollars, but they're not in absolute dollars. They're not very large. That'd be great. Yeah, our budget for advertising next year is one hundred and twenty thousand um, dollars, which is higher than what we've spent in the past. In the past couple of years, um, we've spent about seventy or seventy five thousand. So we're increasing that by about fifty thousand for next year. OK. OK, great. I think between the others, I think my questions have been answered in, in the presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Great, thanks. Um, so I had a couple of follow ups that I will ask as well. Um, in, in follow up to Dr. Merman's questions around um, births, it, my recollection is that Brattleboro was coming up and doing some visits at Springfield or in a in the Springfield area. Is that still happening? It, has that changed? Obviously, they're not doing the births there at, in Springfield, but they were trying to see patients so they wouldn't have to travel. Uh, they have a couple of providers that have remained on our medical staff. Uh, they they have were forced to move their office back to their main site, so I they see. are they are not they are not on site now. But but you know we we are um, they they have remained on our medical staff and have agreed to accept referrals from us. Okay. Great, thanks. It's interesting to get that update. Um, so one of the areas that you've mentioned in passing is um, that you are that part of your efforts to increase volumes and uh, keep people in your community is through improving your operations. Could you speak a little bit more to what operational improvements you're targeting? Well, again, it's just it's just everything we do every day. You know, how, how can we continue to evolve the hospital and improve the operations? A big part of what we're working on this year is around our revenue cycle. And we've made a lot of progress the last couple of years with the revenue cycle. But again, in terms of looking at, um, and again, the three areas we're working on right now involve, revolve around looking at our financial assistance policies and are those the right policies and are we following them appropriately? So that's one part of it. Another part is our um, patient admissions and access process. You know, are, are we are we doing that, following the best practices? You know, we have a lot of great people here, and they've been here a long time, and they've been through a lot of challenges. So we want to make sure that that people have we're keeping up with all the training and education that that is necessary. And um, the third area of that is our charge capture process. In to, to making sh make sure that we're identifying all the things that we do that uh, should be passed over to the bill on on the revenue cycle side, and we want to make sure that we have all the charges correct and and the codes are correct, and that all that we're following all the best practices on how we do those things in the hospital. Thank you. Um, so, in terms of the charge capture process, is some of that connected to you had mentioned uh, increased denials, and certainly we've been hearing from other hospitals that with me increased Medicare Advantage penetration that there's been some increase in insurance denials. So, are those two connected, or um, could you speak a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of denials? Yeah, that's part of the process. That is part of our process, and um, with ours, since our inpatient, you know, I think our process. Um, with our inpatient denials works very well. Um, we have a lot of outpatient stuff. So, you know, chasing down denials on a lot of smaller outpatient claims is is uh, is a little more is a little more challenging. Um, so, excuse me. Um, we but, are seeing you know, that is that that is part of the process, and I'll let Kata speak to that since she is uh, very, in, very involved in this process. So, yeah, you're. Question on uh, Medicare Advantage denials. We are seeing denials um, um, from Medicare Advantage plans, particularly like United Healthcare, um, related to their prior authorization 
requirements. So we are seeing a lot of that. Um, I think our overall denials um, we're seeing kind of decrease over the last year or so due to improvements in our internal processes. Um, but we are seeing some denials on the, the Medicare Advantage side of things due to those you know, prior auth requirements um, that traditional Medicare doesn't necessarily have. Thank you. Um, so you had mentioned um, part of your recruitment efforts are connected to uh, replacing providers that are currently locums. Could you just speak to which of your recruitment efforts you currently are budgeting locums for? Um, are how are you are you changing those budget assumptions in next year? Uh, and just kind of walk us a little bit through connecting that to the budget. We do have, I'll, I'll start and Bob, if you want to jump in, if you have anything to add, um, we do have reduced locum costs in our budget for next year uh, for surgery locums. Um, and we have to, to replace that cost at a lower cost um, to contracted general surgeons. Um, so we do have a savings there. Um, I want to say it's a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, we do still require locum coverage for um, days, there's certain days a month that can't be covered. Um, but we're definitely, we definitely have a savings in next year's budget for reducing those locums and um, taking on two part time surgeons. Thank you. Um, in relationship to sort of the budget trends the last few years, um, I was noticing in the PL statement that your current projection for fiscal year 23 is under budget compared to the 23 budget um, and is coming in a little bit higher, a couple million dollars higher than 22. And then what you're requesting in 24 is a significant jump from your 23 projection. And I know you have outlined uh, your utilization assumptions and uh, a lot of that is driven by that. Um, but I think also last year you had spoken quite a bit about um, trying to capture more utilization. And it it looks like you certainly were successful to some degree, but not as much as you had hoped. So can you just uh, speak a little bit to that and why uh, that jump feels realistic to you? Well, you know, we've had we've had a um we've had a pretty tough couple of months here in the summer um you know ob obviously our first quarter and second quarter were a lot stronger for us but i mean again i think this is related to increased access with the providers you know having having more availability more appointments and if you look at our growth um in our office visits in our specialty practices i mean all of those have far exceeded the budget in prior year, except for general surgery, where we only have the one full-time doctor who is part of our family. And, you know, that's what we were targeting with those recruitments is to have some doctors here, one that are not, a, they're less expensive because they're not locums, but mm -hmm. also because that will be their practice and they will have their own patients and have office hours and that sort of thing. So I think it's a win-win all the way around for everybody. and. Um, if you look at the surgery volumes we're budgeting, and you can you jump back and compare that to what we had five years ago, we were still budgeting well below what we had five years ago. And so, you know, recapt recapturing the confidence of our community, having providers who are here and have access that are our providers and not just people that are here in case we have an emergency room call, you know, so. Thank you. And I think one thing to point okay. out, um, sorry, one no, thing to okay. point out when looking at last year and what where we were at, which was about a million dollar um, law or a million dollars um, better last year. Um, and that's because at the time we had a hundred thousand or sorry, a million dollar USDA grant um, that we had recognized last year. And we haven't been able to recognize any grant revenue yet this year. Okay. Um, yeah. We Thank are you. expecting um, a FEMA, uh, a grant from FEMA this year. Um, we're not sure about the timing of that and whether we're going to be able to realize that um, this fiscal year or next fiscal year. 
Thanks. Okay, I'm I'm wrapping up. I only have a couple more questions. So uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, your service area and um, keeping your your patients local. We're, I'm also wondering if you have explored, and I know this was a topic of conversation in the past, um, increasing shared services or coordinating with other hospitals or entities in your region uh, to reduce duplication. So, of course, Claremont's not that far away. Uh, you know, I grew up in Brattleboro, Springfield's not that far away for folks who are able to travel, and certainly Dartmouth in the scheme of things isn't 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 a bad drive from Springfield. So uh, could you speak to whether you have plans to think about um, how you might work together with others in your region? Well, that is something we do all the time. So whenever we have a need, that's what I do is I call everybody and and determine whether or not there's an opportunity for us to collaborate and partner. And, you know, we have existing partnerships in place I mean, our pathology group is UVM. Um, our radiology group is Dartmouth. Um, our cardiologist, um, until he left, was Cheshire. Um, the, we had the OB doctors here from Brattleboro, and um, you know, we still we still work very closely with them. We are in discussions with other area hospitals regarding the opportunities to return cardiology to our hospital, and uh, those conversations are with other local hospitals that um, have those services now. Um, and we've also had um, we've also had some discussions with uh, Rutland about because we have swing beds and you know they have some patients that have post acute discharge planning challenges. And so you know we've had some discussions with Rutland about about our availability of, of swing beds and their challenges with post acute referrals. So uh, so um, we we talk to everybody and partner with everybody wherever it makes sense. And so we we are very open to do that. Thank you. Um, and then um, I think my last question would be your thoughts about potentially increasing use of telemedicine or other technology to keep folks local. You've mentioned, given us a couple of examples, including oncology, mm -hmm. uh, where you use that. Could you speak to to that modality? Well, we have recently expanded our telemed services with Dartmouth, and we, uh, in addition to the oncology program, we added three other programs through a partnership with Dartmouth. Um, one of them is for the nursery, and, and so even though we don't do obstetrics, every now and then we'll have a baby in the emergency room, and so we have a telemedicine. We have the Dartmouth um, service available to us if that's needed. Um, we also have added psychiatry as telemedicine, although we don't, that's pretty much a backup because we have our own behavioral med providers. And then the one that is um, off to a pretty big start is we added teleneurology, which is primarily for strokes. And we are seeing quite a, quite a brisk use of that service. And it's mostly been in an emergency room, but a few of them have been inpatients as well. And so, so now we have the telemedicine link, and if someone is, we believe, is having a CVA, uh, we have access to their specialist on that. Thank you. So, okay. Um, do, do any other board members have any follow-up questions they want to ask? Can I just ask a quick follow-up on the telemedicine stroke question you just were talking about? Does yeah. that? And I'm sorry if like I'm torturing people at like too clinical of information in this just but I'm just curious is that allow you to keep um, acute stroke patients who don't require TPA or intervention at Springfield by having that capacity or I mean or even before did you were you able to keep patients without uh, a neuroconsultative capacity well I I I think you know? theoretically I think theoretically theoretically the answer to that question is yes it is so new we we um, are about to go back and do a clinical analysis of our first quarter. We just started in in like uh, April or in March. I guess it was in April we did it. And so we're about to do a, a review of those cases to determine what we can learn about the patients and the outcomes in that. So I think theoretically the answer to answer your question is yes. 
uh, what has our actual experience been? I I don't know yet because I haven't seen any um, data on it. But okay. obviously, it's better. Obviously, it's better for the patients because we have world class stroke care that are that are involved in the, the cases now. Thank you. Okay, we're going to turn to healthcare advocate questions. Um, Sam, are you our questioner today from the HCA? Yes. Okay, yep. take it Thank away. You. Thanks, acting chair. Uh, that's a caveat. If you hear some weird sounds, it is our black lab sleep barking next to me. So I apologize if there's some background noise. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as a high, I just want to highlight and commend Springfield on the bad debt and free care changes that you talked about, and um, particularly in regarding the compliance with Act 119. But we noticed that your charity care is, you know, projected to increase to 0.9, or, and that's a big increase over FY22, and the bad debt is going to go down. So that's a trend that we obviously like to see. Um, the first question is really a clarification. Um, in your response to board questions on facility fees, you said, quote, an estimate of the total sum of the facility fees billed and collected for patients accessing the ED was around $3 million, and potential payments around $1.3 million. Are you saying that you billed that in fees but only anticipated collecting a certain percentage of that because of you know, contractual discounts or free care and bad debt? So I'm wondering if you could just talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, the 3.4 million um, in facility fees was the charge. So what was charged yeah. to the insurance companies and the 1.3 million is what we received for payment. Got it, okay. Is there any difference in the facility fees charged by payer or no? Like do you sort that out uh, differently in any way? No, you can't You can't change what you charge. Uh, you have to charge the same thing to all insurers and except if you're um, self-pay, then of course you can apply for financial assistance and get the um, amount generally billed. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, my, only, my only other question is related to your community health needs assessment, um, which indicated that one of the top three concerns you've identified is affordability of prescription drugs. And I we noted that you attribute your 340B to the general operating fund to support the hospital. I'm wondering if you guys have any plans in place to help patients with pharmaceutical costs, like social workers who help patients apply for manufacturer assistance or anything like that. We refer a lot of our patients to Valley Health Connections, who we work with. Um, they have a lot of resources um, to help patients afford drugs. Um, they help them apply for different programs that you can either get free medications or also there's um, vouchers that um, are given out to so they can buy medication. So that's mainly what we do is refer to Valley Health Connections and they're they're super helpful um, assisting patients with that. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Back to you, Acting Chair. Thank you. Okay. We are going to turn to public comment. If uh, you are here and would like to make a public comment, please use the raise your hand feature. And when speaking, please state your name and spell it for our court reporter. We'll just give folks a moment to try and find the raise your hand feature. Okay, well, seeing none, um, Sarah Lindbergh, I just wanna check and make sure you don't have any further Follow up before we move I'm all set. to the closing. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so we'll turn it to you, Springfield team, for your closing remarks. Thank you, uh, Acting Chair. Um, we again appreciate the opportunity to get a chance to tell our story. So thank you for that. Uh, and I want to thank and recognize our hospital family for the work that they do here every day. Um, again, the hospital has been through a lot of challenging times, and we have a lot of people here with us that have stuck by the hospital, and uh, so we can be here to take care of their friends, family, and neighbors here in our area. So I want to I want to recognize our staff for the work that they've done because they're the ones who have brought us through these difficult times and are continuing to carry the load as we as we take these steps to move forward. So um, I want to I want to thank our team for the work that they do, so. 
Well, thank you for joining us today and sharing uh, the information on your budget. We're going to recess now until 1 p.m. when we will reconvene for North Country Hospital.